Hello, happy Cinco de Mayo. Uh, this is like my fourth take. Everyone keeps calling me for some reason as soon as I want to do my project. Um, I'm doing it actually over my phone because my microphone on my computer is pretty garbage and the, the video is not very good either. I have an older computer. So I'll submit it. I think I can submit it straight to Canvas from my phone. If not, I can upload it to YouTube and submit the link there so you can see it. So I'm doing my project on climate change and potential impacts on Bristol Bay sockeye salmon populations. Um, so typically, I thought I'll be looking at, oh, sockeye salmon populations are decreasing everywhere, this, that. And they're actually not. They're doing pretty good because sockeye salmon are, are flexible with temperature change. So they're doing a little better than most other salmon. And they're actually thriving. And that, that did surprise me. I did not expect that. I was expecting them to do, do pretty bad because I heard um, temperatures in Alaska have been high in the past couple years. And the salmon runs have not been as good so discussion of topic why it matters and why it matters to you um so when i first first thing when i kind of got into really loving salmon and fish i took ichthyology ichthyology class at unity and i absolutely fell in love with that like i, I always love fish you can see my big fish tank in the back i always love fish and just learning about them in that class alone, like that really did spark my interest. And then after that, I actually took a Salmonis class. It was just a one credit class, it was pretty short. Um, and uh, I forgot his first name, I think it's Colvin. It was Colvin is his last name, great teacher. And then that really, that, I I just love it. I love salmon, I love trout. And then another reason I chose sockeye salmon is because here in Connecticut, we have Actually, we are one of the only states, I think it's west of the Mississippi, that have a sustainable population of sockeye salmon. And they're located in two lakes in Connecticut. It's in East Twin and um, um, uh, I think it's Highland Lake, I believe. I'm not sure. But anyways, they're, they're actually a smaller version of sockeye salmon, they're actually called kokanee salmon. And they go through the same life cycle, uh, same morphology, same everything as a sockeye salmon, but just smaller. So I was like, you know what? I'm gonna look them up in Alaska. Since in Bristol Bay, that just that is the largest sockeye salmon run in the world. So I was like, why not look see where climate change is affecting the biggest part of the salmon? Because I know in Connecticut they're affected because people illegally introduced alewives and they're also filter feeders, so they compete with the kokanee salmon. And that's another thing I did not know either that sockeye salmon are filter feeders, and I just found that out doing this topic just doing my own research out of curiosity so that is why i chose this topic and that's why it matters to me and it really does matter to alaska as well because alaska's economy and everything is built on the salmon like the salmon are a huge thing in alaska and they're a huge thing to an environment as well because they are a vector to bring energy from the ocean up into the headwaters of these nutrient poor areas because in Alaska a lot of soil there's not a lot of nutrients in the soil up there there's it's just it's kind of it would be barren almost without the salmon because when after after they die so I'll hop back so when the salmon spawn they don't eat when they migrate up the river they're not eating and when they get up there and they spawn out they use up all their energy and then they die and a lot of times when the fish swim up, they actually look like they're rotting. They look like zombies. And um, actually, personally, I've seen this myself in New York. When I go salmon fishing for king salmon, um, from they come up from Lake Ontario, and they do the same thing as well. They actually, they were introduced there, and they end up dying. When you catch them, sometimes they're like rotting and look really gross. So the same thing happens to them. And a lot of times the fishermen will catch them right away at the, at the headwaters in Bristol Bay because that's when they're just coming from the ocean. They're fresh, they're running, the meat is the best. And um, so the, a big problem is it is, so it is climate. It's not typically, it is temperature, but it's the rainfall too as well because the, when the water is really warm in the rivers, the salmon will sit and wait in the bay for that kind of cold spurt, the extra flow of water. And I saw this in New York as well. After we got rain, the next day, tons of salmon were coming up the river. So they do the same thing in Alaska. They kind of wait, they'll sit, 
and then scientists to actually take surveys and see which which species of fish is coming up, how many are coming up, and they determine when the fishermen can start fishing because it is, it is very regulated, super regulated. And they want the fishermen to kind of catch, so they want the fishermen to start fishing kind of the bulk of the run. And then, but with this warm water and kind of unprotected weather, when there is a big burst of water, all the fish come up at once. I'm talking millions and millions of fish. So the fishermen, a lot, so when that happens, the fishermen are let go, they do their fishing, but a ton of fish get by. And that is actually a very bad thing because the carrying capacity of the rivers are overreached. There's too many and they're not eating. So it's not like there's not enough food for them. It's the spawning area. There's not enough spawning space in the rivers and the fish will actually be very stressed out about this. They'll fight, they'll bump and there'll be not enough spawning ground and there'll actually be less fish the following spawning year because there are too many of them. And strange, like people think like, oh, why don't you just let them do their thing? Well, if you do, then you'll see it's gonna happen like a peak. Like you'll see a ton of fish, way too many, it'll drop down and kind of it'll level itself out again. So having the fishermen there kind of regulating it is, is a very big help. So how did I approach this? In the beginning, I had a couple topics and I just did a lot of Googling, kind of see what information is out there because I was, I don't want to kind of start researching something with not a lot of information and then get stuck halfway through with not a ton of information and not a lot to talk about. And I know I love salmon. It's kind of like fish or like my passion. So I thought I'd do a topic on fish and typically I chose, uh, chose uh, sockeye salmon. And I did find a lot. There's a lot out there. So and I was, I actually look forward to doing my research and I look forward to typing. I get excited and that that does help me a lot to actually be excited about the project because I want to do it. And I think this is kind of one of my better papers because a lot of times I wouldn't even like cite sources. I like, I didn't really care. Like I, I, was, I did a good job, but like I'm more passionate about this. So I'm actually enjoying it and doing better. It doesn't feel like work to me. Like I'm having a fun time. Um, like I'm having, I'm enjoying making this video, but uh. Yeah, and plus this is my last paper for Unity College. That's it. After this, I graduate. Um, I think it's May tenth or May fifteenth. I, I graduate. I got my cap and gown in the mail. So uh, from there, so I kind of gather all my information. I kind of saw like what was affecting them. Like so, there was uh, precipitation, temperature, predation, um, parasites. And I kind of added all this into my skeleton as an option to talk about it. I have sources on them. Um, am I going to talk about them all in my final um, my final report? Maybe it. I'm only I think I'm at like about fifteen hundred words. So I do have information on other things I can include, which I have plenty of ammo to shoot back into the paper so I can reach the uh, the word minimum there. And um, like I'm going to talk about precipitation next. I just I kind of do a little more research because I'm. I'm not fairly confident just blurting stuff so i'm just doing a little more research that's why i didn't really include it into my rough draft and like um like for parasites there's not a ton of them not a ton of papers on parasites and how climate change is affecting them um because they come from the ocean the salt water so a lot of the parasites actually don't survive up in the fresh water and they're gonna die anyways after like so I have to probably look for parasites, parasites and like young fish. I, I just, I don't know. It was just like an extra. It's kind of like backup for information. Um, actually, I learned a lot. Like I discussed earlier, I learned that they're filter feeders. And a lot of times the fish, they'll, they'll live in rivers or spawn in rivers. But they prefer to actually spawn on the banks of lakes and ponds. And the point of this is because there's more zooplankton stuff in lakes and ponds so the the babies they're the the fry when they come up out of the gravel they'll they'll feed on zooplankton and small little crustaceans in the pond i did not know that or the lake and typically if there's not a lake or a pond for them to kind of live in for the next uh i think they live for three years and then they head back out to the ocean and they feed out there and then they come back in the spawn and they spend about i think two two to four years in the oceans about the same amount of time but if there is no lake or river, I mean, lake or pond for them to uh, live in, to actually kind of, they'll head out right back out to the ocean as fry, which I found that is pretty neat. That is pretty cool that there's, they have that flexibility to do that. It's just kind of any time. It all depends on environment, location, all of that. So as climate change, climate change, 
oh excuse me climate change happens so is the environment and stuff so different patterns can change as well and um another cool thing i was looking at too is scientists could know what fish came from what river system based solely on their genetics each each system has their own kind of genetic population which i thought was very cool and i did not know that i learned that as well and i kind of looked into like can they supplement the population with hatcheries um and there's a lot of pushback on this because one thing there is no natural selection in hatcheries um so like all the bad genetics like mutations just like fish that are just formed fish that probably just would naturally be killed or eaten in the wild can survive and then pass on the genetics into wild populations which is a bad thing because you're introducing bad genetics making the fish weaker um i did not know that that was cool i learned that as well um and then, and actually another thing too when they spawn the fish imprint on that river as well so wherever they spawn and grew up in they'll return to that same river system and the hatchery when you do that they might not they might not do that at all they might not come back they might go somewhere else and a lot of times wild salmon won't even spawn with the hatchery salmon which i thought that was pretty cool too um and another solution they had for this was like like um like uh nesting boxes for the fish so the little boxes would be in the river like incubators in the river <clears throat> and the point of this is to imprint the baby salmon into that very river and then they would release them as young but there's not a lot obviously the survival rate's pretty low and the boxes are very very expensive so that's not commonly done a lot um so discuss what you learned about the process of compiling the review again organization organizing everything um doing a skeleton actually you gave an example skeleton and I actually used that exact example skeleton kind of structure my paper and that helped out a lot that helped out a lot I think it was about like bobcats or something and I turned it around and used it for sockeye salmon and that really kind of that set me straight I was like oh I know I'm gonna do this body for this this body for that that body for that and that did help me a lot um discuss how this assignment has changed your thinking uh changed my thinking I I just it doesn't really change my thinking I just I kind of learned more. I learned more about the process of writing a paper. Even though I've been in college for a while, like I probably should know this, but like for some reason doing this, like having it structured like this, like do one thing this week, do another thing this week, looking at this body, like I kind of, I feel like I'm a little, I'm, I'm well-rounded. Like I could hold my own and write my, my own paper, cite my sources. And I feel like you, you gave us a lot of freedom. So I was able to actually really enjoy this topic and do it. Um, but yeah, I've, I've learned a lot of information and I could probably make a 30 minute video just talking about salmon alone and not just like the, the whole purpose. I mean, just like the whole, like talking about the topic. Um, like I, that just, it excites me. I'm very excited. Like I talk about it forever. But anyways, oh, oh yes. I wanted to show this picture too of what they look like. So I'll flip the camera around. So this is your ocean run Zakai salmon. And this is your spawning sockeye salmon. And they look exactly the same in Connecticut. So they'll look, that red body, the really green head. And that sparked my interest too. Like seeing that, they're a beautiful fish, like super unique. And that alone sparked my interest. I was like, this is a cool fish. I wanna do a topic about this. Um, why not? It's my last topic for uni college. Um, that's about it. I pretty much, I hit most of the key points here. Um, well. Thank you so much. I'm reaching almost 14 minutes now, almost exceeding the time. Have a good one. Thank you.